Tons of games share common motifs and elements in their gameplay. And I found a couple of games that uses cards as their main mechanic and I started to become interested in seeing how those games take something like a card and applies it to the gameplay, especially with the added context of different game genres. Now there are a bunch of games that are video game forms of TCGs or it's like Inscription, or it's not an actual TCG but it's definitely going for that approach with how it treats its cards. Nah, not looking for that. No, I'm looking for non-traditional card games. Games whose mechanics are built around cards, using those cards as representations of familiar mechanics experienced through the lens of thin card stock. With these games, it's less so about using cards for cards' sake, and more so about taking advantage of the properties inherent to cards that video games use. The four main properties that are employed are the customizability, randomizability, disposability, and less commonly, the aesthetic of the card. The game presenting the mechanic as cards is just visual shorthand for the combination of elements that are borrowed from cards. Customizability refers to the ability of the player to alter and change the deck at the player's use. Growth stems from gaining new cards and replacing the cards in your current deck and using those new cards to lean toward your preferred playstyle. Randomizability should be self-explanatory. When you shuffle a deck and draw a card, you're not supposed to know what card you're getting next, and you have to work with what you have and strategize with a hand you get by chance. Disposability means that once you play your card, it's gone. Unless there's a method to gain it back such as reshuffling the discarded cards back into your deck, then you can't just infinitely utilize a single card. Then there's the aesthetic, that being the visual design of the card itself. When you look at it, you know what it is. It's a fucking card. The five games I want to talk about explore how cards are used in them and how they exploit these four properties in five different genres. Representing action is Lost Kingdoms 2, JRPG, Botan Kai Toast Eternal Wings in the Lost Ocean, FPS, Neon White, Fighting, Toho Hiso Tensuku, and Shmups, Toho Unconnected Marketeers. I know there are other games that utilize cards as mechanics such as Metal Gear Acid and Eat Reunion, but I haven't played those so I wouldn't be able to talk about them. Just know they exist, and let's move on. This is a card that came with a figure of Ava Unit 2 that was sold to me busted, still pissed about that, but hey, I got an Asuka card out of it, and, uh, kinda like Asuka. I put this in my wallet as a joke and straight up forgot it was there until I pulled it back out a couple years later and was confused about why it was there. Lost Kingdoms 2 replaces all attacks and actions that would be standard and expected in action games with summoning creatures with your cards. Your player character does not directly attack themselves, so she, and by that I mean the player, can only interact with enemies via the medium of cards. As the game takes place in real time and isn't something like a turn-based game, limits have to be placed to stop the character from just spamming cards, flooding and face-fucking all on screen. Not that it does that particularly well, but more on that in a minute. Before you enter an area on the map, you are given the option to edit your deck or to go to the card store to either buy new or upgrade your current cards. You can only have a maximum of 30 cards in your deck and all the cards have various different properties, element, type of attack, and also the cost to summon. You got your deck and you're ready to rock. Select an area and you are given 4 random cards from your deck assigned to and activated by face buttons. But hey, if you're not satisfied with your hand, you can just select the one you want anyway, so what's the fucking point? Okay, now we're getting to how this game is busted and unbalanced as fuck, luckily in your favor. The game tells you that you can freely discard a card in your hand and return it to the back of the deck by holding an R and pressing the face button. So really, the random aspect can feel like an inconvenience as you come across an enemy and just stare them down from a couple feet away as you find a good weapon card or some other shit you like. I did mention that limitations are placed on you so you can't just ideally spam your shit and steamroll through the story. The first limitation is MP, the card's gonna cost you to use them, and if you don't got the stuff then say goodbye to them kneecaps. You can get your MP back by killing enemies or hitting up a heal spot. Your second limitation is that the cards have limited uses. This is displayed by the card fading away as you use it. This brings back an interesting element of resource management in the game. You only have so many attacks at your disposal, so don't whiff and burn not only the card itself but also your MP and potentially even HP, putting yourself in a bad situation. While you can go run and gun with your cards, you might burn out so you gotta approach each encounter carefully and actually land your attacks. Actually, you'll end up killing yourself sooner than you would ever run out of cards. These areas are short and you can just run away from most enemies anyway. So, yeah, remember when I said that MP was put in place so you don't spam all your cards and absolutely face fuck the enemy? Turns out that's exactly the optimal strategy for the final boss. I'm gonna show footage of it so click on this timecode to skip it. 
with the right combination of cards, that being the decoy pillar to distract the boss, 28 deaths because weapon cards are the most busted spammable shit ever and you can just buy them, and a sprite which heals you for every time you use a card. Man, this bitch never had a chance. There will always be a meta strategy. I don't know if every limited run game gets a card, but I've got a couple of them the couple of times I bought games from limited run. The first ones I got is a complete set of the four No More Heroes cards. I got them alongside the two special editions of 1 and 2 for the Switch. They're a nice set. The other one I have is from Mushihime-sama, also for Switch. They're cards with key art of their respective games featured on the front, and they're a nice addition to the purchase. But they're also redundant since the included art books, at least for these games, also feature the art on the cards in a larger size and without all the extra shit on top of the art. I can rarely remember the full title of Bot and Kaido's Eternal Wings in the Lost Ocean, and it's a goddamn mouthful and a bitch to type out each time, so fuck you, I'm calling it Bot and Kaido's 1. But in most turn-based JRPGs, when you're thrown into a battle, you're typically presented with menus of options of available actions to take. Take SMT5, for example. There are four main types of actions that are standard to JRPGs. Attack, defend, items, and bouncing the fuck out of there. Your basic attack doesn't do much, but it's free, and every other attack costs resources. Defending tends to be a free action, items can be used in a pinch, and escaping is a fuck this fight button. But rather than given a series of menus allowing you to freely choose your actions, those actions are instead represented by the cards in your deck. At the start, random cards will line the bottom of the screen and you can play a maximum number of cards on your turn. Both the amount in your hand and the limit of how many cards you can play can be increased as you go through the game. I think the systems in play are neat, but there are some aspects that play a major detriment, especially during longer encounters. There are four major types of cards, attack cards, defense cards, item cards, and etc. The first three should be self-explanatory, but the fourth category are cards that just don't fit the first three. That being taunting, cameras, and escape. You can use attacking item and the etc cards on the attacking phase, and on the being attacked phase, you can play defense and item cards. This would be a super basic bitch system if it weren't for the elemental properties, and especially these funny little numbers cornering the corners. When you're playing your cards, you can either try to make pairs or straights for percent increases to damage or defense, and this adds a fun level of depth that feels orgasmic when you pull some big dick shit off with a ton of cards at once. But the biggest problem is, the cards you get in your hand are random. Here's a scenario that happened to me way more than it should. It's a boss fight. You're loaded up with cards and it's one of your party members turn. You fucking blast them with a bunch of cards, doing a hell of a lot of damage and it feels real nice. Then it's that character's turn again and everything left in their deck is healing items and armor. Neither of which you can use since they aren't weapons. Well, shit can't use anything until either someone else gets fucked up, or this character gets targeted to be fucked up. So, this turn is a waste, unless I decide to straight up waste cards and discard them one card per turn. No more than that, only one card per turn, which is a fuck. So, your choice is to waste turns throwing your resources out until you get what you need, or until you force a turn to reshovel your deck, or waste turns until that character gets targeted. Either way, it feels like shit, because the system to get rid of your cards is shit if the randomization fucks you over. And that's because there is no system to do that. In something like the standard JRPG, you might waste a turn because you're out of resources. But in Baten Kaito's 1, you might waste turns because you have the wrong resource, which can potentially feel shittier, depending on how you respond to that scenario. And to round out Baten Kaito's 1's cards, the way you customize your deck is very similar to Lost Kingdoms 2, both one really neat addition. Your cards can change over time, so something like milk can turn into cheese, resulting into a better healing item. Warp more often, your bananas will rot. Did you know that the release of Persona 4 Arena Ultimax contained tarot cards? Cool addition, am I right? Except that list can go fuck off because Ultimax only came with half of the Major Arcana. If you wanted a full set of the Major Arcana, you've gotta also get Persona Q to get the other half. They're modeled after the tarot cards Persona, and that is pretty neat. I do wish they were higher quality as you can see where the cards got cut on the edges. Years later, Atlas decided they wanted to revisit the card idea with the release of Soul Hackers 2. I didn't even know that this game would even come with cards until I looked at a sticker on the plastic wrapping that said it featured art cards. The cards are translucent, which is rad. Neon White is the most unique of these games I've chosen in the way it utilizes cards, and it's the only one that uses the aesthetic of what a card is to its advantage. This game is a mission-based speedrunning shooter where each mission is less about killing enemies and more about finding the fastest possible route through a level, and your cards are your tools to do such. Rather than entering in with a loadout of guns or abilities or whatever, you have to pick them up per level as cards. 
Each card is tied to a gun and an ability. Your pistol gives you a second jump, your rifle gives you a dash, your Uzi gives you a stomp. So not only do you have to use these to shoot your targets, you have to use the abilities in stylish as fuck ways to traverse the mission as fast as possible. It's a fast as fuck game where you need to react quickly and you need information even quicker, so the guns taking the form of cards is an important aspect of the legibility of the game. Having the guns look like large, colorful rectangles makes sense, as it is way easier to read the color purple than it is to read a silhouette void of the surrounding card. If you're relying on peripherals to determine which gun you have equipped, you can't rely on shape because you could easily mistake the pistol for the Uzi. But it's harder to make that mistake when you see either yellow or green in your peripheral. Another way that Neon White is unique here is that it doesn't utilize the randomization or the customization of cards at all. The game is mission based and it contains crafted levels. Levels where cards are predetermined so you're able to learn and optimize the level. As I said, there's no loadout going in. There's no way to customize what you got, the game will instead give you what's needed per level. And even then, gotta be careful with your cards. The abilities tied to your cards have limited use. You use an ability, you burn your card. Not only can you not fuck up, but you've gotta find creative uses to get the most out of your cards. Because once they're used, and if you fucked up, gotta restart. I don't know the rules to any game that uses Hanafuda cards. And for those who didn't know, yes, these are Nintendo Hanafuda cards. These cards can be bought in red or black, but I thought the red looked nicer. They're small, they're thick, and they got good looking art on the front of the cards. Speaking of cards with attachments to a game company, when I went on a school field trip to the Smithsonian Museums, I got a deck of Atari playing cards from one of the gift shops. They're garbage to actually play card games with since it requires some extra time to process the suit of the deck, so they exist as just a novelty deck. The idea of characters using spell cards in Toho has been around since Embodiment of Scarlet Devil, but it wasn't until the fighting games when you actually get to interact with using cards. In Toho Hiso Tensoku, cards operate similarly to the way supers work in traditional fighting games. You play the fight game, you build meter, in this case the spell gauge, you can then spend meter on your cards. You can customize your deck to suit your playstyle, which I think is pretty cool. I don't know or care how the FGC feels about that and having to memorize matchups or some shit. I don't care about competitive scenes. And when you build meter, you get a random card from your deck of 20, up to 5 cards, or 5 levels of meter. There are 3 types of cards that you can shove in your deck. Spell cards, skill cards, and system cards, with the first two of those types being unique per character. Spell cards are identified by their orange borders and are just supers. They're big fuck off attacks that can use up various meters and burn the highlighted cards. Pretty standard affair here. Skill cards, bordered in grey, are a lot more interesting I'd say. Skill cards can provide two effects, the first being upgrades to your kit. If you use a skill card corresponding to your 214 motion for example, then it will just straight buff it up to 4 levels. But what I find neat is that you can completely replace your moveset. If you use a skill card with an alternate 236 motion, then that will overwrite that motion, allowing you to play to your preference if you like one move over another. For example, Yomo's 236 defaults to a projectile reflection, but if you didn't like that, you could change her 236 to either Lotus Dance Cut, a projectile that goes across the screen, or to Phosphoric Slash, a short range projectile that acts like a boomerang. It would, however, have been really nice to be able to change the default motions in this profile menu and then also maintain the option to change her moveset mid match as well. What if I didn't want to open up having a reflector? What if I, second one, wanted to throw out the Lotus Dance Cut? but I'm just not allowed to do so. And the last of the three card types are system cards with red borders. These cards are universal to all characters and have various effects. These can range from stopping timed reposition, summoning homing bullets, or raining fish. These would be more situational and act more like filler cards because you have to have 20 cards in your deck. Can't have a deck with less than that, unfortunately. The largest cards I own are some art cards that came packed with the Mad Max Anthology and DVD release of Haibane Renme. The Mad Max cards feature promotional art, the stuff used on posters. They're okay, but the Haibane Renme ones are so much nicer. They're printed on thicker, sturdier material and feature art on both sides of the cards while Mad Max's are only one-sided. Man, the Haibane Renme DVD set is so fucking nice. Love that shit. No more spin-offs, let's talk main games now. And when it comes to the mainline Toho, Unconnected Marketeers is the only one of them, as of writing this, to have the main gimmick be cards. And the way that the game's ability cards are implemented gives the game a roguelite feel as well, able to make each run of the game feel different. Pick your difficulty, character, and you can pick out an ability card, which you can unlock the ability to start with more later, and at the end of each stage, with that sweet, sweet cash you picked up, you can buy a couple randomly selected cards, or a couple of cards that aren't random, like the boss cards or some item cards, if none of the other cards seem interesting or useful. And unlike all the other games talked about, these cards are not disposable. Once you have a card in your run, it's yours. You're free to use and abuse it as much as you need. 
well, until the end of that run, of course. There are four types of cards. The first I've already mentioned, item cards. Item cards up your resources, your money, your power, your lives. The second types are active cards. Active cards require a button to be pressed for their effect to be used. That effect can either be a rock to delete bullets, or an even bigger rock to delete everything. These typically work on cooldown with the exception of something like Yukari's Gap, which you can use freely. Equipment is extra firepower or a type of shield that appears on the screen. For example, you can have Alice's doll just hang out, getting sicked on some fairies who walked into the wrong neighborhood, or just some Magatamas that will eat bullets from the side. I feel the defense cards are a lot more situational and not commonly useful compared to most other cards you can get. And lastly, there's passives that passive buff you and adds a mechanic or change how you play. These, to me, tend to be the most useful cards. These range from pretty shit and situational like Yu Yuko's card that will randomly erase bullets when you graze and goes to damn near necessary like Koishis, Sakis, Patchies, and Tays. Absolute units that increase your longevity, especially if you're shit as me. Like damn, longer death bomb window and I get to keep my money when I inevitably fuck up? Thanks Tay, you shithead. That shit is cash. It's interesting to see how the same concept can be used very differently in various contexts. It really goes to show how versatile cards are conceptually. In some games, cards require resources, and in others, they are your resources. And the properties that games borrows from cards can also differ greatly depending on what the developers want out of the systems they have in mind. The randomization aspect is a common trait among these games, but it isn't universal. None of those properties are, and that helps create unique experiences despite it being the same thing. Just a card.